it's my great pleasure to briefly introduce to you the nine recipients for this year's Ruth First Scholarships. The selection panel reported that the quality of applications was very high, so congratulations and well done. Um, we're also very delighted that the number of recipients has grown from four in the first year of the award to six for this year and now nine for next year. As this is the 30th anniversary of Ruth First's assassination, we decided to ask the recipients to do something different from what we've done in previous years. So as you can see from the program, we have given each of them a segment of Ruth's life to report on in a brief speech. Although they were given the topics and time to prepare, the speeches are unscripted and we are looking forward to what you are going to say um, no much, as, as much as you are. The recipients will participate in the order that I'll read out and as appears in the program. But note that we will pause for a musical interlude before the last two speakers. So our recipients for this year are Tafadzwa Makuza from Witchwood Primary, Ntabeleng Motlala from Alston Primary, Zara Akolwaya from Linksfield Primary, Daniela Nico from Sir Edmund Hillary, Pilile Nkabinde from Mondio Primary, Kefilwe Tladi from Eastgate Primary, Ngalula Tsiembi from Johannesburg Girls Preparatory. We'll then have the JP Tlabelela Choir perform for us. And then finally, we'll move on to Nolutando Zikalala from Johannesburg Girls Preparatory and Shafar Shaikzi from JP High Preparatory. So over to you to Fatswa. Thank you. Makusa, and my topic for today is Ruth's family and what it would have been like to be a JP girl. I stand before you today because all those years of being the nerd have finally paid off and it's got me the Ruth first trust fellowship. Well, who is Ruth anyways? So let's take a scroll down to the past. She grew up with her parents who were in the South African Communist Party named Julius and Matilda I. She also had a brother but I don't think brothers back then were like these nowadays brothers who yell, get out of my room before you even knock. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, while walking on the street with the constant hatred between all the different races, it had Ruth thinking. She was privileged to be taken to one of the best schools in South Africa called JP High School for Girls. It must have been a girl's heaven for her. Like everybody else, she would have woken up early and got ready for school because being late was not acceptable. She would have enjoyed every day seeing her friends because they always helped her in everything she had. She must have been a perfectionist because being a library prefect was a very organized duty. She was very excellent in English. She was also very good in writing and thinking. She wrote an essay about unfairness called poetry and it made into the school magazine. She also later obtained a, a distinction in English. She just loves being a girl, a JP girl and attending school. It is a brilliant school and words can't describe it. It changes average girls into strong women. Ruth first fought for rights against apartheid and that's why we have scholarships in remembrance of her. So in conclusion, I'd like to say, JP Girls High could also make me like that, like Ruth first one day. And next year, it'll be an honor just to walk the stairs and corridors that Ruth first walked once upon a time. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ntaleling Nisala, and I'll be speaking about a remarkable woman. She attended GP High School for Girls, and by the way, she was the first person in her family to attend a university. In 1946, she obtained a bachelor's degree from Burt University. Her fellow students included Nelson Mandela, Eduardo Mondlana, Joe Silver, and the list goes on. You may wonder who this she is. She's a remarkable woman, a woman of integrity, a woman who fought for education. She's the reason why we've all gathered here 
to honor her name. The she is Ruth first. Ruth first journalism. Ruth first journalism played a big part in the war against apartheid. Her style of writing was original and reached a variety of audience. She excelled in writing, winning the English Prize and obtaining a distinction in English. In 1941, School Magazine contained an essay entitled Poetry. It speaks of her deep sense of justice. We also see how she expressed the truth and beauty, which sometimes we ignore and in our rush our lives. Ruth was a researcher in Johannesburg municipality for a brief time. Describing working in the apartheid was boring and disgusting. She became an investigative journalist, revealing the brutal reality of the apartheid rule. She joined the Guardian newspaper and became the editor. When the Guardian was banned, she and her three daughters moved to England with her husband due to exile in 1963. She continued working as a political activist and a writer. In 1969, she explained how she was dedicated to ending the apartheid. Ruth wrote important books on African history and political, including The Barrel of the Gun. She co-wrote the biography of Olive Schreiner. She was the author of a number of books and articles, such as The Militarism of Africa and Migrant Laborer. Ruth also wrote The Maputo Connection. She had interviewed people who had participated in the anti-apartheid movement. In the book, she writes about their experiences. Ruth was a devoted wife and mother of three daughters, namely Sean, Gillen, and Robert. She was an investigative journalist, a writer, an activist, and a feminist, and her efforts had a huge impact on South Africa's democracy. Her books and articles have touched many South African hearts. Her courage, determination, and dedication will always be remembered by all South Africans. solitary confinement. In 1963, Ruth first was taken into custody under the 90-day detention law. Released after 90 days and allowed to walk out of jail, she was immedi immediately re-arrested and subjected to intensified interrogations. Afraid she would say something that would affect what she fought so hard for, she wrote her family a farewell note and swallowed a vial of coals. To her surprise, she awoke a few hours later. In her very powerful words, she wrote, I was bereft of human contact and exchange. What was going on in the outside world? No echoes reached me. I was suspended in number, unknowing, unreached. Folded into her meticulous details of her internment or interrogations, the sounds, smells, and routines of prison life, the impressions of God's the effects of deprivation and psychological torture on her active mind. At the end of her incarceration, she went into exile with her husband, Josh Lover, and her three daughters settling in North London, where she published her novel, 117 Days, in 1965. At the end of 117 Days, which concludes with her release from prison, Ruth comments, when they left me in my own house at last, I was convinced that it was not the end and they would come again. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and fellow learners. My name is Pidilin Kabinde. In my speech, I'm going to briefly outline Ruth First's life in exile, specifically at the Durham and Eduardo Mutlane University. Ruth's first reputation in South Africa as an investigative journalist, an anti-apartheid campaigner, and the former polit political prisoner preceded her life, her arrival in London in March 6, 1964. It was a reputation she would maintain and elaborate during the years she spent in exile, contributing to the struggle. In 1973, she began lecturing at Durham University on the sociology of underdevelopment a position she would hold for six years. She spent periods of settlement at the Dar es Salaam Maputo universities. 
1977, she was subsequently appointed as a professor and a research director at the Center for African Studies at the Eduardo Motlani University in Maputo, Mozambique. This is when she showed interest in the plight of the mining immigrants from Mozambique, for which she wrote a research paper. Sadly, this is where she would meet her assassination. It is said that the plight of the mine worker lingers on, even in the post-apartheid South Africa. We can take a leaf from the lessons shown by Ruth. Thank you for listening to me. Good evening to you all. My name is Ndabla Chiemi, and I'm from Johannesburg Girls Preparatory School. Tonight, I'll be reciting a poem by Bridget Olafler. There is no date free. Hey boss, hey boss. And time, by understanding them, will you succeed. In our fight to liberation, there are no dates for free. Then waiting, oats, oats, oats. Up until you've paid everything, thou shalt pay your capital until your capital will go up. You sent us a bomb, we open it, we die. You heard us screaming and shouting like vain roosters. But wait. We are difficult to see because we have not a shallow color. Then wait for summit of your shoulders. Man, wait. Thank you. I believe when we mention Ruth first, we don't only think about her courageous ways, but also her sad and sudden death. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tifi Redladi, and I'm here to tell you about Ruth First's assassination, a typical example of brutal killings that came with oppression. I guess even women with strong characters get frustrated because my findings state that she attempted to commit suicide after being put in a 90-day solitary confinement for the second time. Luckily, her attempt failed and she was released only after 117 days. To avoid prison again, she went into exile in London. However, she was still active in the anti-apartheid movement. In 1972, she became a research fellow at the University of Manchester. And in 1973-78, to 78, she was a development studies lecturer at Durham University while working at universities in Dar es Salaam and Lorenzo Marx. And November 1978 saw her working as the director of the research training program at the Eduardo Manzani University in Maputo. In Mozambique, Ruth First and Joe Slovo lived in a high security ministerial compound opposite the presidential palace because their lives were in so much danger. She went to work on August 17, 1982, not knowing that Craig Williamson, a major in the South African police, had ordered out her assassination. She was reminded about her mail by her boss, Aquino de Braganza, and a particularly thick envelope caught her attention. Sadly, this envelope turned out to be a parcel bomb that exploded, wrecked her office, injured her companions, and most importantly, claimed the life of an extraordinarily brave woman who had lived and died in the name of fighting for freedom, justice, peace, and unity. To think that a month before her death, she had told her mother back in England that life was too short. Nevertheless, her death was not in vain because South Africa got the freedom that she, fight, she had been fighting for. Thank you. Ruth First was a journalist of high standard, a unionist, writer, mother, and a freedom fighter. She used all of her abilities to fight social injustices that contributed to the democracy that we all have today. What would she be saying about South Africa today? With regard to poverty, she'd be very disappointed that the South Africa's education level is falling behind, especially that now Eastern Cape did, had lack of classes and shortage of teachers, and Limpopo had no textbooks for nearly nine months. But at least our metric pass rate last year increased, but then we still need learners doing maths and science. Crime and corruption. Irrespective of all the 
irrespective of all the efforts the government has done to fight crime, we still find drugs in schools, child rape is increasing, and domestic violence is still continuing. She'd also be disappointed that the people who are supposed to be helping the community are the ones who are taking bribes and government tenders into their pockets. I'd like to thank I'd like to thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> In Ruth's first time, Jeffy Girl, Jeffy Girl, was a very different school. If she were here today, she would have been very proud to be a Jeffy Old Girl. And to see that all her hard work fighting apartheid had finally paid off. Not only had Jeffy Girls become a multiracial school, but a school that embraces many different cultures and cultural activities. The traditional African drumming group, Mamela, is a very good example. While she would enjoy all these new traditions, I think that she would have been proud to see that the school has upheld all its old traditions, like its annual flower show, which started in the 1920s. As a journalist, teacher, and activist, Ruth Burr showed that she was a great leader. She would have been overly proud to see all the leaders that Jeffy Girls has produced, like Isabel Hoffmeyer, an A-rated professor in African literature of Vish University, and Jules Newton, an entrepreneur who received the Top Gender Empowerment Award in 2010. And Rachel Zadda, the author of James Squash Tokolosh, was also a Jiffy Old Girl. After Ruth first graduated from university, she taught evening classes in black schools to help the pupils have a better education. So she would obviously have appreciated how her old high school still maintains a 100% pass rate every year. Yes, Ruth first would have been sad at the state of education in our country today. Inequalities in education meant that those, or only those who could afford quality education, such as that at Jeffy Girls, are able to attain it. But she would have been pleased to see that the Ruth first scholarship helped address the situation. I think, had Ruth first been here today, she would have encouraged all that at Jeffy Girls to make an effort to create a better South Africa for all.